is a, an honor for me to be here this evening and pay special tribute to Roger Baldwin, the First Amendment's most dedicated advocate. We join tonight as both celebrants and guardians of the freedom of speech. Back in uh, Boston uh, a week ago, uh, one of my constituents came up to me and said, I hear that you're going to make a speech to the ACLU, and I hear those people go around <laughs> defending communists. And I said, oh, no, you've got it wrong. They defend communists and socialists, fascists, atheists, racists, segregationists, members of the Ku Klux Klan. The fellow said, uh, well, it, it sounds like a uh, mighty nice organization. <laughs> Now, living in a democracy is like living on a raft. It never sinks, but your feet are always wet. <laughs> well, our feet are always wet. We've always got a struggle on our hands, and we will continue that way as far as we can see and as far as the need demands. Roger Baldwin began working for human rights in the early part of this century. He got into civil liberties work during the First World War, helping conscientious objectors fight what he thought was an unjust war. And in 1919 and early 1920, he and his colleagues founded the American Civil Liberties Union. He's always been a maverick. But he has some kind of very deep emotional identification with people who have had to battle their way up, even though he didn't have to. He had it. Harvard, class of 1905, a father who was a businessman in the Boston area. He was on his way to becoming a successful businessman or something like that. That's where he was going. I think it must have taken something pretty remarkable to say, I'm not doing that. Somehow he thought up this idea that no matter how despicable an individual's opinions may be, everybody has his free speech. And that was such a good idea that he set it up and it just kept going. He looks back upon a time when civil rights and civil liberties didn't exist anywhere near to the extent that they do today when free speech was just something that was not possible when you could get arrested for distributing a leaflet, when people didn't have the right to strike if they were oppressed on the job. When he started, it was 20 or 30 people who had nothing more but the bizarre belief that uh, they were going to somehow limit the government uh, in, in, its, in its powers. Um, uh, these were 20 or 30 people who got together to, to decide that they were going to enforce the Bill of Rights. Today, we handle 6,000 cases annually. We enforce the Bill of Rights on the government. We are the realization of the dream that Roger had. I've often thought it must be wonderful for him to look back upon those beginnings. Congress investigates communist activity in the United States. Representative Hamilton Fish of New York, heads committee. The Communist Party in the United States is merely a section of the Third International. The first time I met him was when he came to testify before my committee investigating communist propaganda. Ninety percent of their work was defending communists for urging the overthrow of the government by force and violence. And I don't know anything more radical than being a leader in the fight against communism. Naturally, I was opposed to that organization, uh, Civil Liberties Union, and to Mr. Baldwin, who was head of it. I'm a radical in the sense that the Bill of Rights is radical. It is radical. I'm certainly radical in the sense that pacifism is radical, which is quite radical. Uh, always a man of peace and who is opposed to violence and coercion is regarded as radical because he doesn't go along with uh, some of the coercive measures of government. We were under suspicion that we were not really defendants of everybody's rights that we were very partial to the left, very partial to the union. It wasn't true. It was only that they happened to be our clients because they were the people who came to us for help. Nobody else would help them. 
the prosecution was so severe that somebody had to hire lawyers to defend him. It was the first time that a general organization held out its services to everybody whose rights were denied. It was a question of freedom of speech here for aliens who, who sought to overthrow the government by force and violence. And I was bitterly opposed to that. And uh, Mr. Baldwin, his organization, was in favor of it at that time. But the general concept that people have rights against the government, which the First Amendment asserts, is a very old one. And uh, the general doctrine of natural rights, that people have these rights as human beings, and the governments merely affirm them in some kind of a document or constitution, but the people who got them by their very nature, their right to speak and to print and associate, that those rights come with you with your birth. Let me ask you about your private life. You told me that your private life had more effect on you than anything else. Your first marriage was to a very prominent international traveling feminist yes. of her day. What was the attraction of a feminist in the 1930s? She was very good looking. In You're not supposed way. to say that as the major attraction of a feminist. <laughs> well, I know, you should, but also she was a woman of spirit, and so many interests that were exactly the interests that I had. I think that was uh, what really brought us together. Madeline was very committed to uh, ideas other than feminism. Yes, she was, she was a lawyer, mm -hmm. socialist, feminist, pacifist, all the good things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you ever clash politically or ideologically? Oh, no, no, no. We just clashed domestically. Just domestically. <laughs> <laughs> What's your second?